Okay, welcome. I am Dr. Jacqueline LeBlanc, Vice President and Provost at Glasgow Caledonian New York College. And I am very happy to introduce the first installment of our Center for Social Impact and Innovation Trimester C guest speaker series. We have with us today, Dr. Jeffrey Ann Wilder in conversation with Dr. Tammy Hodo, who will be speaking about the effects of Florida's new law, HB7, on teaching at the University of Florida. Designed to spread the notion that teaching about racism and teaching about gender inequality are divisive, discriminatory, and racist, the law includes strict provisions for how schools and colleges teach US history and the history of racism. The ACLU of Florida has described the law as part of a dangerous trend nationwide to chill free speech in classrooms and workplaces and prohibit the teaching of concepts like systemic racism and gender discrimination. Doctors Wilder and Hodo will speak about this law in the context of the University of Florida and a movement underway to challenge it. So let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Jeffrey Ann Wilder is a sociologist, writer, and thought leader. As a consultant, speaker, coach, and commentator, Jeffrey Ann specializes in various aspects of intersectional equity, including anti-racism and women's empowerment. Jeffrey Ann holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Florida, and she completed a PhD concentration in women's studies and gender research. From 2008 to 2018, Dr. Wilder served on the faculty at the University of North Florida as a tenured associate professor of sociology and the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations. Jeffrey Ann currently works as a senior research faculty for the National Center for Women and Information Technology, which convenes, equips, and unites nearly 1,500 change leader organizations nationwide to increase the influential and meaningful participation of girls and women in computing. These DEI efforts aim to change the face of technology now and in the future. Jeffrey Ann is one of the nation's leading experts on colorism in Black American society. Her research on colorism studies spans more than 25 years and her 2015 book, Color Stories, Black Women and Colorism in the 21st Century, focuses on the ways in which skin tone bias and discrimination impacts Black women and girls. As a scholar and an advocate for social justice, Jeffrey Ann is the recipient of many research, teaching, and leadership awards, and her work has been published in an array of academic journals and publications. As a mother of two young daughters, Jeffrey Ann is committed to amplifying the voices of single and working mothers and advocating for more family-friendly workplace policies, including paid parental leave, better childcare, flex time, and accelerating equity for moms of color. In her free time, Jeffrey Ann watches as much college and professional football as she can. As a self-professed fanatic of the Cleveland Browns and Florida Gators football teams, I'm from Massachusetts, so, okay. <laughs> Dr. Tammy Hodo is the founder and president of All Things Diverse LLC, which provides consulting services to businesses, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, and government entities who value diversity and want to develop a high performing inclusive workforce. All Things Diverse is dedicated to helping organizations realize the full potential that can only be achieved through deliberate action. She established the company after working in academia for over 15 years and experiencing issues surrounding race and sex. Some of the services her company, off her company offers include diversity, equity, and inclusion training and workshops, assessments and surveys, strategic diversity planning, and diversity audits. Tammy earned her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in Urban Studies with a minor in sociology in which she specializes in race, class, gender, and ethnicity. She used critical race theory for her dissertation, which examined the experiences of minority faculty 
at a predominantly white institu institute of higher education. Tammy continues to be active in academia as she writes academic articles relevant to the experiences of minorities in America. Her most recent publications are two chapters in African-American Families, Research Theory and Practice. She wrote about the urban experiences of African-American families and theoretical and methodological issues of studying the African-American family. And she recently completed a book with a colleague entitled, Having the Hard Conversations on Race, Ethnicity, Politics, and Social Justice in the Workplace and Educational Settings, which is due to be published this year by Rutledge. She is also a service-connected disabled veteran of the US Navy. So thank you so much for being here and I very much look forward to listening to your conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. LeBlanc. Um, it is um, such a pleasure to be sitting here sharing the uh, virtual stage uh, with Dr. Hodo, my dear colleague and friend. And uh, Dr. LeBlanc mentioned uh, the, the notion of um, having tough conversations. And Tammy, you and I uh, embrace the tough conversations. We run toward them. We don't run away from them. And so that's exactly what we plan on doing this afternoon. Um, before we jump into the conversation, I just want to set the stage, um, if you will, around why this topic is so important and why diversity, equity, inclusion um, conversations are continuing to grow. So we all know that the 2020 deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and many, many others uh, sparked an international moment to once and for all confront anti-Black racism and to transform societal structures that had been long steeped in bias and inequity. Um, and as a result of that, um, as we both know, the demand for subject matter experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion had literally skyrocketed. Uh, many equ equity-related role, inequity related roles had been growing already since 2015, but what we've seen uh, since the um, untimely uh, death of George Floyd and others truly has been uh, a significant, momentous flashpoint a racial uprising that really only quickened the need for organizations to create new diversity roles, to embrace those conversations, and to really uh, look inwardly at their organizations and find ways in which they can improve. Um, so Jobs Giant, Indeed, uh, reported that between September 2019 and September 2020, um, Indeed job postings in diversity, equity, inclusion rose 56.3% from 143 jobs per million to 219. Um, and so we know many of those C-suite roles, executive director positions, chief diversity officers, uh, you name it, they continue to grow and are exploding. And we know that in addition to those internal roles, a lot of organizations have sought out diversity consultants like yourself, running firms and consultancies, really wanting to do that tough work to partner with folks in a collaborative way to improve. Now, so we've got that. We know that DEI has become a household term. We also know that things like CRT, critical race theory, has become a huge buzzword as well. So alongside the growth of DEI, we have seen this backlash, if you will, to anti-DEI sentiments, uh, things running counter to that, and many policies in place trying to stop um, truth telling, to be told, right? stopping folks from really getting in, doing that work, having those conversations because it's making folks um, uncomfortable. So I know that our goal today is to talk and to drill down, really look at what's happening in the state of Florida, uh, where I lived for 16 years and, and Tammy, you live currently. Uh, we know that the, the state of Florida was one of the first states to really introduce policy in their state legislator, state legislation, legislature, excuse me, um, to ban critical race theory and other things like DEI, consulting practice, whether that's um, at organizations or even schools. Um, but Florida is not the only state. So before we jump into that, let's take a moment and look at what other states like Florida are trying to do there. So there are actually a number of states who have already banned critical race theory in their state and in its teachings. So in addition, in addition to Florida, Arkansas, Idaho, Iowa, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and Tennessee have already 
banned critical race theory and relevant teachings and trainings, what have you, that really are related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, I'm currently in the state of Ohio, which is one of many other states who are in the process of introducing legislation to ban critical race theory. Here are the other states currently trying to do that. Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Washington, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. I think I named probably all of the 50 states. So this isn't a Southern thing or a, an Eastern thing. This is an American thing. We have to really, really pay attention. So that kind of sets the stage for why it's so important for us to have these sort of dual conversations around the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, particularly as it relates to curricular teaching, training, um, and also what kinds of things uh, we need to be prepared for as, as states continue to push forth these kinds of, of legislations. By the way, it's 2022. If anyone wanted to look at their watch um, or check to see if it's 2022 or 1952, right? Mm -hmm. um, so before we get started, I love for you, Dr. Hodo, to just share your story with our audience. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey overall. And then if you could share with us your particular journey into the DEI space. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Weiler, and thank you, Dr. LeBlanc, for such a nice introduction. I'm really excited to be here today because, like you said, Jeffrey, Ann, this is a critical time in our nation, um, and we find that people are trying to rewrite history, and it's already been, for lack of a better term, whitewashed anyway, um, but to really take away all of that. So my journey within the diversity, equity, and inclusion really began because my parents married in 1962 and I am biracial. So my parents married before Loving versus Virginia. Uh, my mother is of German, English and Welsh descent and my father's African-American. And I grew up really cloaked in white privilege, right? So my mom's blonde hair, blue eyed and she just took care of everything uh, for us and we just kind of appeared and everything was fine. Uh, we grew up in a predominantly European American space and didn't have many issues. I uh, went into the United States Navy where I got my first taste of institutional racism um, and had some experiences that were rather unique and very much based on that social construct of race as well as sex. Uh, and decided to go ahead and finish my term and get out and go to a historical black college because I really found that I had, um, and it really messed with my psyche, uh, the institutional racism that I experienced in the Navy. And I was pretty sure of myself and self-confident until that point. Uh, and my mother, the European American, right, sent me the list of the historical black colleges and universities and said, you know, my dad and her spoke recommended that I attended one because they understood I needed to be built back up. Um, and so I've been in this space for quite some time, I think because of my unique family dynamics and, and knowing that, you know, we have, you know, um, Native American nephew, uh, Costa Rican niece, uh, and we're just a vast array to me of what America is, that actual true melting pot. Um, and the reason I chose to look at the lack of diversity in academia for my dissertation was because as I began at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I just did not see a lot of people who looked like me in positions of power, let alone in the classroom. And Milwaukee is actually a minority majority city, but it wasn't reflected in, in, at the university, um, especially again in positions of power. And so that is really what has led me to this journey. And I'm just really interested in social justice and recognizing that our world is not equitable. And that we have to have these conversations and we have to dismantle this institutional racism and inequality and bias that is baked into every structure of American policies and practices. I mean, reality is, is that when the constitution was written, half of my ancestry were not even considered people. Um, you know, and, and so we just have to have these real raw conversations. But what's really astonishing to me is how people are saying, well, it makes them uncomfortable um, to have these conversations or they feel like with HB7, uh, people are being guilted or shamed. These conversations are never about guilt or shame. They're about enlightenment and incite, you know, inciting and, and hopefully um, 
getting people to gain additional knowledge. You know, when I do a lot of the training, I always begin to be talk about our indigenous population whose land we all occupy. Um, and I'm on Seminole land right now. Um, and just talk about the boarding schools that they were placed in. That was a federal you know, policy and practice. And it was an attempt to strip them of their custom culture and language. And they were the first original inhabitants of the space and just how institutionalized that was. And, and just to, for people to understand, you know, that these type of uh, issues have been going on, you know, for as long as the pilgrims initially arrived. And I'm always amazed though how people don't even know about the, the, the boarding schools that they had for our indigenous population. And so that tells me they, that, you know, the lack of knowledge that is being shared in K through 12 about the real history of our country um, it, that really needs to be addressed. And I think one last thing is that unlike, and I lived in Germany for six years and I've been to South Africa, Germany has had some reconciliation surrounding the Holocaust. South Africa has had reconciliation surrounding apartheid. America has never had racial healing and reconciliation. And that's why I think we continue to have these conversations and that's why we continue to see like murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey. I think that with the murder of George Floyd and the COVID uh, pandemic, it was the perfect storm because people were shuttered and they were in place and they had to watch that traumatic murder of a man on TV. And we all saw it. And this is something that our community has known about forever. Um, but it was something I think that a lot of people actually got to witness for the first time. So instead of a person of color sharing with you what they see and what they've experienced, they actually got to see it. And I think that is why we've seen that call for change within businesses and organizations, because it's awakened a lot of people to what is what we've known has been taking place for, for a long time. That, that is so very insightful, and I completely agree with you. This notion of reconciliation and healing, you know, I think that was our turning point um, as more organizations, as you talked about, wanted to do something different or, or to even do something at all, right, as opposed to saying, staying silent. So I know that we, we need to, we want to talk about uh, the woke bill, right? Florida House mm -hmm. Bill 7. But before we do that, I think it's important for us, for our audience members to do a little bit of level setting. There are so many words that get thrown around today. Um, you know, I said before, DEI, the acronym is really a household name. And I know that anyone right now understands or at least recognizes DEI, that acronym. But far fewer people really know what diversity is, what equity is, what inclusion is, what, what, what those things really mean. So let's take a moment before we jump into uh, the response to DEI through those, you know, those policies. Let's just spend a little bit of time level setting with our audience. When we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, what does that mean? So, I mean, diversity is variety. It's recognizing that people are different with varied perspectives and life experiences. We know some of the variables that impact diversity and ethnicity um, are, I'm sorry, that impact uh, diversity, our ethnicity, social economic status, sexual identity, orientation, expression, religion, race, age, ability, perspective, national origin. But I mean, if we were to get down into the weeds, you could talk eye color, hair color, um, you know, diversity of thought, right? Perspective, religion. We all are diverse. There are no two people who are, have the exact same lived experiences, and diversity is great. I mean, studies show that when you have diversity at the table, decisions are made quicker. Um, there, you know, much more effective meetings, uh, and that a lot of like the marketing uh, errors that we see, like the recent one we saw about Juneteenth and and a European American woman wearing a shirt about Juneteenth is her holiday. Um, those things don't happen if you actually have that diversity at the table. So diversity is variety. Equity, though, I, and this is one of my biggest pet peeves. I hear equality and equity used interchangeably. They are not the same. Equality is assuming we're all starting at the same vantage point when that's not the reality, right? Um, you know, when we look at America, we know women didn't even gain the right to vote until 1920, right? With the 19th Amendment and women in the South still didn't gain the right to vote at that time. So when I talk about equity, I always, you know, talk about equality being very different than equity, understanding it's not interchangeable 
and recognizing that equity is about the qualities of justness, fairness, and impartiality. We have to treat people according to their circumstances, which often have a lot to do with historical as well as contemporary policies and practices. So think about housing covenants. Um, I'm a service-connected disabled veteran. I use my VA home loan. I'm in my second home, house I purchased using that, but veterans coming home who look like me from World War II, who fought in segregated troops, could not utilize it because of housing covenants and redlining. You know, we know that women, when we think about equity, still lack equitable pay. We see the U.S. soccer team, finally, the women's soccer team is going to get equitable pay. But that's what that's about. It's justness and fairness and rest, recognizing we're not starting at the same point. And we're giving people the tools to meet them where they are in order for them to be successful. Um, and then inclusion is really more than just having that seat at the table. It's being heard, your input considered in the decision-making process. And that is so important because oftentimes, so being at the university, just like you, we see diversity on campus. We just fail to see it in positions of leadership. So when I'm on the campus um, and, you know, when I was the last university I was at, I would see people who look like me who tended to work in food services. They were the executive assistants of uh, the janitorial staff and the groundskeepers. And these are all legitimate and uh, great careers and there's nothing at all wrong with that. But when I began to look at people at the decision-making table, when we're talking about policies, we're talking about curriculum and you know how we're gonna implement and do certain things, that's where I saw that lack of inclu inclusion um, and that lack of diversity. And we have to recognize you know, that these different perspectives and being at the table is very important because it creates that equity and that justice and fairness that ideally we all should be striving for. Thank you for that. I think that's so important. You know, when we talk about DEI, it's for a lot of people alphabet soup. You're just kind of saying these, these things, but not really understanding what it is because we don't know, or at least we don't have a common language around what people mean when they say diversity, equity, and inclusion then it really does put folks at a disadvantage for really understanding why these policies that are being set forth at the state level are truly problematic, right? Mm -hmm. So we know it's just bigger than DEI. Um, you mentioned, you, you really provided for us in your um, response, a very intersectional response, right? And intersectionality is something that you and I have um, heard of, know, write from, teach from, embrace, probably for the, you know, the better part of, um, two decades, and uh, a lot of historians and sociologists and social scientists like us recognize that, you know, an intersectional perspective is really something that is not new. It is something that has been around uh, for a couple of centuries, right, mm -hmm. um, originating from women of color. Tell us about, uh, define for us intersectionality, and um, talk to us about why that's an important piece of this, this conversation. Well, I would, so I would like to first start, like when I hear conversations about affirmative action, right? And, and we've heard, I think we've all heard that. And people, when they hear that, they assume or they picture you and I. But reality is, is that European American or white women have been the primary benefactors of affirmative action. And our experiences are completely different, often rather different than theirs because they're women, yes. And, and that is a diversity component, but we're women of color. And so we have those overlapping identities that oftentimes create a disadvantage for us. So intersectionality refers to the overlapping and interdependent system of advantage and disadvantage that positions people in society based off that social construct of race, class, sex, and other characteristics. Um, you know, so it's, it's looking at those multiple identities. So not only am I a woman, which we know continues to be a marginalized group in America, but I'm a woman of color. I'm also a veteran, I'm a disabled veteran. You know, so over these interlapping intersectional identities that I have often are put me at a disadvantage, you know, and that's why I wanted to start with the affirmative action because again, people envision you and I, but real, realistically and statistically, it, it is not those that look like us that benefit, although we're the poster children for that, it's actually European or white American women. So just recognizing, yes, we know as, as white women, there are issues just based on your sex. But when you factor in that beautiful melanin that we have in our complexion, um, it's an additional barrier that we have to overcome that tends to be a disadvantage. 
that that was really um, really important, very helpful because you're right. And and none of us are singular individuals, right? There isn't anyone that I know who think about themselves as one dimensional, right? We're multi dimensional folks, you know. Um, Dr. LeBlanc was doing my introduction, and um, I always put in my bio the things I've done, you know, educationally and career wise. But I'm also a mom, right? Um, and a football fan, right? Um, and a Pilates junkie. All those things make me who I am. And those things are really important. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, people may only see one aspect of me, they may look at me and see black woman, but they may, it may take a long time or a while before they see PhD, right, or other things, or people may uh, base their judgments, uh, you know, make decisions about me based upon one particular identity or two identities. But it really is about those overlapping identities. And the reason why we're um, spending a little bit of time unpacking these is because, again, uh, HB7 and then the, the House bill currently in the state of Ohio that is anti-critical race theory is also explicitly states that this policy aims to outlaw or ban um, any discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, trainings. Um, they intentionally um, inserted the term intersectionality as something to be banned and also critical race theory. And that is common across all the different states that I talked about. So let's jump into critical race theory. That's probably the toughest one to unpack for people. What exactly is critical race theory? So tell us that. And then also let's talk about what it's not because I think that's important as well. So I, I think it's important to very much have this conversation in regards to critical race theory. I think people do not understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a soundbite that they have run with, and they're very ill-informed. And I see people who look like us who even speak out against it. And I'm just like, really? Because critical race theory recognizes that intersect of, of race and the law. You know, it's, it's how do we explain the legalities of housing covenants and Japanese internment camps? It was developed by legal scholars, but examines laws that intersect with issues of race. Um, when we share the history of our country, we have to discuss the legal enslavement of Africans, right? And African-Americans, Jim Crow laws, things like that. Um, these, there have been both federal and state laws that have been implemented to impede the full development. So critical race theory acknowledges that race, although a social construct, plays a major role in our country. Um, we have to, again, acknowledge that our country was founded with the notion of African Americans being inferior to European Americans. So, you know, racism we know is difficult to cure. Um, it's only those blatant acts as obviously discriminatory can be addressed by policy, such as like housing covenants and redlining. But that social construct of race, um, it produces social thought and relates and relations. You know, race is a social construct that was invented by humans but it very much plays a role in policies and practices. And critical race theory just really recognizes um, and examines how the dominant society has racialized different minority groups at different times in response to the shifting needs of the labor, the labor market. You know, so when we talk about critical race theory, it is a nexus of American life. You know, it's allowing us as people of color to tell our stories, right, our perspectives recognizing that our narrative has not been written. Um, I know there is, um, I think there is a Native American proverb, or I'm sorry, it may be an African American proverb that basically says, as long as the conqueror writes the story, he will always be the victor. And, and to me, critical race theory allows the voice of the other to be heard. And it happened at a time when it was a slow implementation of the Civil Rights Act. Right, so we saw the slow, very slow implementation of change in our society after the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And so legal scholars are the ones who came up with critical race theory. And what's amazing to me is what it's not, is it's not taught in K through 12. What it's not, it's not taught even at the university level unless you take it as an elective in law school. And what it's not is, it, you know, it's none of these things that people think that tell you that one person is inferior and another person is superior. What it recognizes is just that intersect of race, which is a social construct, and the law and how that has factored into policies and the experiences of people of color. 
And so again, I just think it's very relevant that people understand and they look it up. Uh, I love Derek Bell. You know, he used to write from the narrative of critical race theory. Um, I also love, um, you know, a, a variety of the scholars, but the school of thought again holds that race um, exists at the nexus of American life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so important, uh, Tammy. When this sort of anti CRT backlash first started, I was so confused because um, you and I both know that <laughs> critical race theory, to your point, is not something everyone is exposed to automatically. It's something that I learned about um, in, in my doctoral program. So not even my master's program, in my doctoral studies. So I'd gone through all of K-12, gone through undergrad, gone through a master's program, got into a doctoral program, took an elective, and at that point was exposed and learned about critical race theory. Now we both, you know, teach it and write about it and operate from that perspective, but you know, the vast majority of Americans and certainly not the vast majority of children will ever be exposed to or be taught about critical race theory throughout the course of their, their lives in school and their schooling. Um, and so I think it's been so interesting to see how, as you said, it's just become this catch-all that has sort of be, be, been this umbrella for all things that make people uncomfortable um, that force people to kind of like move away from tough conversations. Um, and it's been sort of like this dog whistle for things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's start talking about the specific state of Florida. Okay, all right, the land we love. Um, so since the death of George Floyd, um, how has your consulting firm been impacted? And if you could tell us about what kinds of or organizations have been looking to partner with you since this massive shift in uh, momentum around DEI and trying to uh, you know, create more equitable organizations. Well, with the, the murder of George Floyd, I did begin to get many more inquiries from businesses um, in regards to helping them create like strategic diversity plans. I found that a lot of companies began to do an internal um, review you know, and they looked internally and they saw what they were lacking and they recognized it and they began to reach out and ask for climate surveys uh, for assistance with uh, creating a diversity, equity and belonging committee or team uh, for assistance to review their policies to make sure that they were not inherently uh, discriminatory or biased. You know, um, we found companies who wanted to have conversations surrounding, you know, affinity groups you know, um, what type of uh, holidays they should be celebrating. I think with the, we know with the murder of George Floyd, now everyone knows what Juneteenth is, you know, which is something as a, a biracial child growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I always knew because we celebrate it extreme. It's a large celebration in Milwaukee and who would think that? Um, but I did find that a lot of organizations were reaching out and they wanted some help because they had done that internal look. They realized their C-suite was not representative of the population that they serve, um, and they wanted to make changes. Um, and so that was great. You know, I saw some that it was kind of hit or miss. It was like, well, this, you know, is the sound bite for right now. So let me make this move and let our company know that we're doing this. And then they didn't really do anything with the data that they were provided if I did a climate survey. And I saw others that had been ahead of this already and recognized, you know, and just wanted to continue their journey or actually go and dig a little deeper, you know, and begin to do some book clubs and have conversations surrounding um, inequity and recognizing bias is another big one. And I know that's something, you know, within the bill too. And it's like reality is as human beings, we all have bias, yes. you know, and, 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 and not all bias is bad, some is good. I mean, as women, we know, you know, our bias helps us, you know, flight or flight, fight or flight, you know, things like that, you know. But um, I did find, again, you know, a lot of organizations reaching out. Some were just for a quote, just to say, we checked this out. Others were very much more in tune, recognized that they needed to do some adjustments and I've worked with them. Um, but I would like to bring this up and this is one of a uh, pet peeve of mine is you mentioned Indeed and how many new jobs, right, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. I have seen a lot of new organizations or firms or consulting companies pop up with a lot of anecdotal information, mm -hmm. not based in research or practice or mm -hmm. best practices. And they are really muddying up the water just because a person has a certain complexion or is a woman or is that does not make them qualified 
to be a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. But I've also seen organizations do that even before um, George Floyd. I, and I was at the National Association for Diversity Officers in Higher Ed Conference, and they spoke about this. And I was really surprised, but I, I found it to be true that a lot of organizations will hire DEI people. They won't fund them. They don't have access to the president. They have no staff. They have no budget. I've also found though too, and no disregard you know, to the diaspora of Africa, but I found a lot of organizations will hire people from the Caribbean or the continent because they don't bring with them a lot of the baggage that African-Americans do in regards to the historical knowledge and the institutional component um, of, of you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so they have the appropriate face of uh, the people but not that knowledge base, you know, or, you know, and, and I know you know that as well, that they've done that, you know, they bring people in who are not qualified for these positions, but they have the right complexion for that position. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> you just dropped a lot of knowledge and <laughs> I have to follow up on, on um, two particular things that you said. And one of which I know Dr. LeBlanc is going to be so happy that I did. The first is really um, because, you know, GCNYC is part of a global um, university. And, um, you know, this DEI conversation is not something that's unique to the United States, of course, that many people um, are really looking to shift um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, across the world. Um, and you talked about, um, in particular, um, Germany and also South Africa, um, but there really is something uh, historically that is distinctive about the United States experience that really centers on anti-Black racism, uh, BIPOC racism that is really, really important um, and, and something in order for us to move toward that healing that you talk about. We must um, hit that square on and address that um, in order for us to really uh, be change agents for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I just want to um, talk about the distinctive nature, uh, not in a um, arrogant way or what happened in the United States is more important than what's happening ev everywhere else. That's not true, but there is something about the origin of race and how race develops um, in the United States that was very different and still is very different um, compared to other nations across the, the, the world that is really important to, to think about and consider, right? Just in terms of black and white, right? So, so that's for the next webinar, I'm sure. The other piece that I know that um, I mentioned, alluded to Dr. LeBlanc, um, there are a lot of folks who don't have the training um, in DEI who may want to, or may have been called to do the work, but um, GCMYC actually does have that training, right? So GCMYC is uh, launching a brand new master's program in diversity, equity, inclusion, leadership, that will provide that training, that research, that grounding, that centering of intersectionality that is so vitally important, that global perspective. So um, I know that there are probably a lot of folks on this uh, webinar who might be listening at a later time um, who may know that, but there are people who don't know that. And that is actually a huge feather in the cap of GCNYC to be starting and launching a, a graduate level program, not a you know six week intensive cer certificate or something that you can pay $2.99 for and get a certificate that you can put on uh, LinkedIn. No shade, I've done it myself, but <laughs> this is an intensive level coursework that will be rigorous, that will provide folks that training for them to get out and do the work in the right way, regardless of what type of job they're in. Okay, so I know that we're running um, short on time and I wanna jump into HB7. I also see that there is one question in the, the Q&A. Wanna encourage other folks to put questions and comments in the Q&A uh, moving forward. Uh, you and I will talk for a few more minutes and then we'll open it up to um, address some of those questions. Let's jump to um, HB7. Um, and we know the specifics about that, but if you could tell us a little bit more about HB7 and tell us what you personally did to counter HB7. So HB7 um, it is a very problematic uh, House bill for me that was passed um, and will take effect July 1 in the state of Florida. Um, and it was um, uh, imposed by our governor, who I do have to say has an undergraduate from Yale and a law degree from Harvard. So I know that he knows what critical race theory is. Um, but that's a conversation for another time as that has been banned here from K through 12. But the bill would prevent companies from subjecting any individuals as a condition of employment or training to training 
instruction or any other required activity that promotes advances or compels such individuals uh, to believe a defined, a defined list of concepts related to DE&I. And like you said, we have to always begin with the terminology. And one term you used was BIPOC, which means Black, Indigenous, People of Color, because one of the first courses I offer is always DEI terminology because people do not understand but what, what the terms are. But what the bill will do is it will um, really impact the classroom in regards to conversations surrounding race. Um, instructors will have to appear objective, which I think faculty already are at that level, um, but they will be able, they will not be able to make anyone feel guilty is the ideal behind the bill is when we have conversations around race, we should not have anyone feel guilty, which is never the intent. And what it could do is it discourages really DEI training programs because it doesn't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable or guilty and it could be considered unlawful. Um, it's very problematic in the sense that we will be excluded from having conversations about meritocracy, about white privilege, uh, about bias, uh, you know, about the, the real history and the conversations that need to take place in America. Um, you know, a lot of people think that it is, um, I know that it is a pushback. It is a pushback, and this is Dr. Hodo's perspective from All Things Diverse. I think that um, with the um, election of our first biracial president, because that's what he was, um, he's, you know, half African, I think, and half Irish, um, that we saw what we call white lash. And we saw that happen with the last president that we had. Um, and this ideal of white nationalism, um, which is very concerning to me as a service-connected disabled veteran of the U.S. military. Um, and so we've seen that. And so to me, the, this is kind of still that ripple effect, the after effect, that backlash from the former president who actually had a similar bill in the federal uh, legislature, which did not allow, and my company did have a contract and does have a contract in the state of Georgia with a federal organization, which stopped my training on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that was passed as an executive order. And as soon as the new uh, ed, uh, president came in, was taken away. So I'm sorry to ramble, but I'm just so you know enamored with this whole HB7 um, and people not being able to have real conversations surrounding race and sex, um, it, you know, not being able to talk about bias, uh, anyone saying that they feel uncomfortable, you know, could lead to a potential lawsuit. Companies are going to roll back any DEI conversations because they're going to be fearful that they may be sued. But no one has ever asked me as a woman of color and a service-connected disabled veteran, how many times I'm uncomfortable each day in a country I wrote a blank check for? No one asked me that. Um, you know, so again, this, this is really dealing with race and sex, and it's kind of trying to make things racially colorblind, which we know is not realistic. We cannot have colorblind policies and practices because that's why we continue to be in the situation that we're in right now. And we see that generational wealth gap just continue to expand between different um, ethnicities because of these policies and practices. Okay, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm seeing some excellent questions being posed in the Q&A. Um, I want to um, ask you about um, your personal response, which mm -hmm. was a lawsuit. So you filed a lawsuit against Governor DeSantis. Tell yeah, me a little bit more sure about did. that. And, 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 and so I sure did file a lawsuit because it's illegal what he's trying to do. So mm -hmm. I, uh, along with uh, another PhD, I won't say what university he's from, um, in Florida and several other individuals, I think one lady is a social studies teacher, which would make sense. Another one um, is a, an educator as well. So in the K through 12, but we filed the lawsuit with Shepard and Shepard uh, as, as the attorneys, and they filed the lawsuit. So the day he signed the uh, bill is the day the lawsuit was filed. And it basically is saying that this is unconstitutional. He's infringing upon our rights, that this is going to have a negative impact, not only on businesses such as myself, but on the entire state of Florida. 
um, in regards to the knowledge that people are going to have surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And yes, Dr. Hodo did indeed sign up for that lawsuit because it's egregious what he's trying to do. And I just have to say, as a uh, you know multicultural person, I'm really struggling because I know that Governor DeSantis is a descendant of Italian immigrants. Mm. And Italians, just like Irish and Polish, were not perceived as white when they initially got here. They were treated as less than. They were discriminated against in housing and employment. And so for him to come out with such a bill just shows me how, um, you know, he he is not very long-sighted um, because it's obvious that he has forgotten the history or maybe they did not share with him what his family experienced when they initially came to the U.S., uh, my personal opinion is that it's uh, used, it's being used as a political, um, you know, uh, it, tool in order to exactly. advance, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the fact that you filed a lawsuit against the governor of Florida is, um, you know, <laughs> beyond bold. And I think it is really telling um, your level of courageousness um, and your willingness to, you um, you know, it, that's a very risky thing to do, uh, particularly in the state of Florida, because we we know uh, the broader terrain in the state of Florida. So uh, kudos to you. Um, I know it's just just the beginning and you have to be sure that, um, you know, to keep us posted as things progress, um, uh, because for you, it, it's, you know, it's it's a principal issue. But this is also, um, you know, a personal thing as well. Um, I'm going to jump to um, we've got three questions. Um, in the chat, I'm going to start with the first one. Um, I'm going to just read the comments and then jump to uh, the two questions. Uh, so what on earth are all these states concerned about freedom of speech? The truth will set you free comes to mind to counter the legality and morality of such gag laws. So infuriating backward. Uh, but I imagine this le legislation can, uh, indicates how truly close we are to equality and inclusion. So close that they are willing to institute desperate regulations that are clearly on the wrong side of history. As a white woman, white Jewish woman, my minority is not visible, but I'm always shocked when I hear anti-Semitic speech and when I can see the recent white supremacist chanting and demonstrations. How can I be allowed to speak and learn freely about my culture, history, and criticism of anti-Semitism, but not CRT? FYI, my family has experienced German re reconciliation, no money, but a trip to Germany and a bit of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just I just think all of that is she's so spot on, and and it's true. You know, I mean, think about the NAACP. It was founded by W. E. B. Du Bois and two Jewish brothers. Um, the Jewish community has experienced a lot of anti semitism You know, uh, and it's just it's so problematic, and oftentimes, like she said, it's not seen. You know, but there was some type of reconciliation, and I do think that this is a political ploy, and I think that there's a big fear factor in America. I think that we have a lot of European cisgendered males who are, are terrified that we're seeing the demographics change in our society. But what I don't understand, if everything's been equitable, why are you so concerned that the demographics are changing, that America is becoming browner? It's because you would actually have to acknowledge that everything has not been based off of meritocracy and that positionality there, I think many people are afraid of losing. I was shocked uh, with the lawsuit when I did provide the attorney some additional names and I shared with Dr. LeBlanc before we started of faculty who are full professors who are at retirement age, who, I, who say they're allies, who did not sign up or not on board. Allyship is a verb, that's an action verb. Yeah. So that you know so when when that happened and i gave those names that's something in my mind i just can never forget um that you were not willing to do that but you're already tenured you're at retirement age it would have cost them nothing to sign up and be on board but they say they're an ally but that's not true allyship to me well and i think you know we've all heard the term uh, performative allyship right um, so just doing allyship to make it look good, like this notion of window dressing, hiring a DEI person, but no budget, no resources, no access to the president. Allyship is the same way, you know, you know, being a, a true ally, being a true person doing this work in this space, you know, you, you have to put some skin in the game, so to speak. And so that's mm -hmm. important. A um, couple questions, um, and I think we still have a little time. Given the reliable black uh, backlash that progressives 
progressive initiatives face today. How do we move toward justice and inclusion knowing it often prompts disproportional violent response and a deluge of mis and disinformation? Are there ways to manage in the current circumstances or must we simply keep fighting the good fight in the face of these challenges? Well, that, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know I'm just, I'm, my brain is just going, right? So I, I think that we have to be actively engaged in the conversation and we have to recognize how important local elections are. You know, not just the big elections, right? Local state elections are very important. I think that we need to do our, our due diligence and looking at the uh, potential candidates and their past history in regards to policies, uh, you know, relating to this. Um, I think that we need to really, um, you know, seek support from our allies. This is something that people of color cannot do on our own. I mean, we're just not in those positions uh, and, and, and we're really going to rely on our allies. So I, I like to get in good trouble. Um, and that's what I like to do in Florida is get in good trouble, right? File lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say really get on board with some organizations um, like the ACLU, um, and some others that are actively working to dismantle um, these, these laws and, and policies that are very discriminatory um, towards people of color and women and, and, and Jewish people and you know, just marginalized groups. Yeah. And we actually uh, also, uh, we've talked about other groups. We have not uh, talked about the importance of, of being inclusive and thinking about the distinctive marginalization of the LGBTQ community, um, which, and it is Pride Month, um, and it is really important to think about the distinctive um, experiences that community has. Again, not a monolithic community, but very diverse within that. And it's important when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that is really the, you know, the essence of being intersectional. Think about how different communities experience things, right? And that's exactly what equity is about. Um, so we have one last question. What age do you think children should start learning about critical race theory? What do you say when people think K-12 is too young? I, yeah, I, I think K-12 is too young. It's a theory. I, I, I'm just like you. I was introduced into it. I went through my bachelor's, never had it. My master's, never had it. Was in my doctoral program, took it as an elective, thought, found the paradigm uh, extremely uh, interesting to me when I looked at the situation that I was in. So I don't think that it, it, children need to learn about critical race theory at all, but I do think that they need to know the true history of this country. It's never about guilt or it's not about shame. It's about enlightenment, it's about empathy, and it's about people understanding why certain people are in different positions. You know, so if we talk about like our indigenous population in the boarding schools, if you wanna talk about housing covenant and redlining and why, you know, because one of the famous things in America is everyone should be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but that's difficult to do when you have no boots or someone else's boot has been on your neck for 200 years. So I think that when we have these conversations, again, this is not something for children, you know, but you do not raise your children to be colorblind because there is no such thing. But I know just like you that we continue to hear that, well, I don't see color. Unless you're colorblind, you know, literally, you do see color and that's okay because that's what diversity is and it's unique and it's beautiful. You know, so I, I think that critical race theory is exactly where it should be in law school and doctoral programs. And that's when we have these conversations. I don't think that children necessarily need to be engaged in any of that, but they do need to know the history and the conversations that are taking place within our society. Yeah, and, and I do think part of the issue that folks have isn't really about um, the validity of the history, but the emotions that it conjures up. Um, for folks um, and, and what to do with that. Um, and again, when you're, you're creating spaces for open, honest, transparent conversation um, and discussions, then you can, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you can move away from guilt because it's not about making anyone feel guilty or feel badly about our collective American history. And that's the beauty of our nation, right? I'm um, in our world, thinking about the ways in which we're different, how we're connected, and being able to find ways to move forward together um, as a means to get better and improve. So uh, with that, I'm gonna to toss it back to Dr. LeBlanc because I know she may have a thing or two to uh, say um, as we wrap up. Absolutely. And, and you know, first I want to say that GCNYC you know, would not have the Masters in Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Leadership Program that we're going to launch in January 
if it were not for Dr. Wilder, who served as our consultant and was our partner developing you know, all of that. And we were able to submit a very, very strong application, which included syllabi, the, the, the whole thing, the, the entire program to New York State Education Department, uh, if, it, if it were not for the work that you put in. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful for that. And they were impressed uh, when, you know, when they reviewed it. Uh, and I would, I would like to also just bring up maybe a thought that's maybe also a question. You know, critical race theory now, it, the, language, the language has become co-opted, right? To be something else. Uh, it's become a tool, a political tool. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm concerned, right? That diversity, equity, in, and inclusion is, is following, following that, or some people would like it to follow that. In South Dakota, the governor there asked the university system to shut down the diversity offices. And they, they, they have, well, I, either they, they shut them down or they, they've renamed them to opportunity centers based on what I've read, you know, some faculty are saying, well, we're still doing the work that we were doing. You know, we've had to rename this, but renaming them and, and taking hold of, of the language is powerful. Uh, so anyway, with, with the question that came up is how, how do we move from there? I would like to figure out a way that we take back the language and in control of this language and, and not uh, let the, the political forces that are, that are against real equity and inclusion, let them take, take control of, of the language. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Jeffrey. I was gonna say, I had not heard anything about South Dakota and it just, it is very scary. Um, I mean, this is, you know, we even talked about <laughs> Roe v. Wade, but it, it's almost like all of these things are happening to sort of undo all the work over the past 50, 60, 70 plus years. And it is very scary. And we have to be just remain vigilant in the work that we're doing, stay focused on our purpose, continue to, you know, fight that good fight. You know, Sammy said, getting in good trouble. Um, we have to just continue to push back and to tap into our allies and our communities and, and, and to not be silent about this and to push back as, as much as we possibly can. If we think about over history, other communities who have done that to push us to this point. Now we're in that same position again, we have to push back. So a hundred years from now, folks um, are not in this position today. Yeah, and, and I definitely agree with Dr. Weiler. And I mean, if, if you think about like, right, it's Pride Month, queer, how they've taken the word back and empowered it, right? And I think that is part of the process is that we need those allies because it can't just be us. Uh, reality is, is we're, we're still very much marginalized as women of color, even with, you know, doctoral degrees from state universities, oftentimes we're still questioned. You know, you're an angry black woman or, you know, it, it, you know, how legitimate is your PhD or this, but it requires us to push back and we have to have people in those spaces that don't look like us, who are at the tables that we're not at, that are, are, are being, are willing to push back and actually do information and make sure that, hey, when this term comes out and we know that it has been defined incorrectly, someone else comes out and defines it correctly. And that way that people actually gain the knowledge. We need people to use critical thinking skills to stop mimicking what they hear and to actually do some research. TED Talks are great. You know, look at, look at some educational tools, but please stop listening to these sound bites because that is not accurate information. It is a ploy to get you to believe certain things. And this is just not okay. We have to use our critical thinking skills. Okay, with that, thank you. Thank you very, very much. This was a, a very rich discussion. I look forward to having more discussions like this and to you know, welcoming these discussions in our classroom as we, as we launch the program and the new, the new courses. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Wilder, Dr. Hodo, and thank you everyone who attended. Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, bye-bye.
Thank you both so, so much. That went really, really well, I thought. I'm glad. I enjoy it. Dr. Wilder and I could talk all day, though. I know, I know, and I miss being, living in the same space, uh, you know, with, with, you know, being in Florida and stuff, uh, being able to do this. I think this was, um, this was great. Yeah. 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 I think so too. So hopefully we can get some movement, but yeah, but again, like I said, I was very disappointed in the people who did not sign on and you know, some of them, Jeff Rand. Yeah. So it's, um, that it feels, that sounds devastating, honestly to me and um, thank you so much for, for you know, doing, doing what you did uh, with the lawsuit. And I really want to hear about what happens. Uh, okay. And you know, I would like to follow this and have, have a follow-up you know, at some point mm -hmm. and say, look, what, what's going on with that lawsuit? What's going on in, in the state uh, with these actions? So I think that we can continue this conversation. I think our community is gonna wanna hear about it. I agree. Yeah. I mean, you're literally putting your business on the line for this. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart. No, it's not. No, it's not. But you know, when, when my mother used to take me to women's right marches as a child, so I've been in the game a long time. So <laughs> I just remember she would say, you know, at the, at the protest, if the police, you know, grab you, Tammy, just go limp, baby, just go limp. <laughs> so, I, you know, uh -huh. so it's just, so I've been, I was brought up, you know, my mother's a retired social worker for battered women. So I was just brought up to do this type of work. So I have no issue with it because what's right is right. And, and, and the political rhetoric surrounding this, that, that is inaccurate and just, just, uh, just really gets under my skin. So yeah, no problem. But I would enjoy to continue the conversation anytime you would like, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care. Okay. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.